uh, see if this works. And is it, is it working? I think it is. Let me try to uh, get onto the keynote. Can everybody see that? Yep, you can see it. Sure? Okay, good. Well, uh, hello, everyone again. Welcome back. I'm glad uh, New Orleans managed to dodge Sally. So I feel horrible for Pensacola. Just can't imagine how New Orleans would have processed two feet of rain uh, that fell in a, what, 12 hours or something. That's crazy. So I uh, hope everybody's safe and dry. Uh, and hope you, you sound like you got some good drinks. Like I said, I've got a dark moon. I'm enjoying it. So way to use spiced rum. I'm not a big spiced rum fan, but this is actually a really tasty drink for, uh, for a spiced rum drink. I would, I would make this again. Four stars. Um, so let's get to it. Just a, uh, a quick recap, uh, three-part class, rum history, rum production, rum consumption. We started last week with rum history, sort of a quick 350-year survey of uh, rum from its early commercial origins in the West Indies to present. Uh, tonight, we'll be talking about the production of rum, how rum is made and how that different production methods change the flavor. And next week, we'll be talking about modern rums and drinking rums, rum cocktails and the like, uh, sort of a tour of various distilleries and what's out there. So uh, like I said, tonight's rum production uh, will largely be production. Uh, but I also, I think, mentioned at the end of last week that I want to start off talking about Louisiana. Um, more to the point, what I want to talk about is rum industry, but more specifically, I want to talk about is lack of a rum industry or the question of why it doesn't have a rum industry. So. To get into the case of Louisiana, let me just recap a little bit from what we talked about last week. Uh, history of rum, basically three parts, the rise, the fall, and the return of rum. It's a new world spirit made for colonists by colonists uh, with the commercial rum industry founded in the West Indies and spreading up to the Northeast into uh, New England, Mid-Atlantic, where a number of rum distilleries existed, people using cheap molasses to make that. It was a uh, spirit that just dominated the colonies from uh, early settlement up through the revolution. Uh, and after the revolution, for various reasons, rum declined, whiskey emerged uh, dominant. Uh, as is the case with many action heroes and adventures like this, their rum had a sidekick and the sidekick was sugar. Uh, we, we uh, Rum and sugar were sort of like Abbott Costello or smoke and fire where there was sugar, rum was certain to be around, if not right in the room, then lingering right outside the door. Uh, and in many cases, uh, rum's legacy has persisted. Where, where it was established, it continued on for centuries. The, uh, it didn't leave behind uh, uh, manor houses and castles and majestic public works, but it did leave behind active and productive industries where it was uh, established early on. Uh, the, the past persistence is often in plain view. Uh, you can see that in Jamaica here at the Ray and Nephews, Ray and Nephew uh, distillery where the Appleton 21 is made. Uh, in Guatemala, where there's uh, Zacapa is made, uh, this is the aging warehouse up in the mountains. In Venezuela, where they get Santa Teresa rum, all these places, sugar producers. Guyana, uh, El Dorado rum made in Guyana. That's this uh, ancient distillery there. Uh, and on Barbados is the uh, Mount Gay and Foursquare and West Indies rum distillery there. Again, rum, I think, commercially started in the in Barbados and it, it's managed to persist there. And then there's Louisiana. What do you see different between the previous slides and this slide? Louisiana is missing a rum industry. Uh, neither Louisiana or the producer, any other, really any of the other producers of sugar along the Gulf uh, Coast have a robust, robust and continuous heritage of rum production uh, that dates back two centuries or more. Everywhere else, there was a legacy of sugar that widespread rum production seemed to follow uh, and leaving, that, like I said, that legacy of rum. But here it did not. So I have to apologize here, I get a little sad. I, uh, I probably have to have a, a drink and, and wipe my eye a little bit. So I get sad about thinking of all the sugar that Louisiana produced that went to waste on breakfast cereal when it could have been used to make some delicious rum. All those daiquiris that were not to be. So let's, let's have a moment of silence for what was lost uh, here. The um, the state of affairs actually is a bit surprising to me, not only because it's been so persistent in other places, uh, but that it's like, I mean, rum is just, it's persistent where sugar is not even. Uh, so many of the West Indian islands today that, that originally saw their 
uh, economic growth due to sugar production. Uh, sugar may have faded away, but uh, and it's happened on island after island. The sugar has been replaced by condos and golf courses. It turns out there's a better return on tourism than there is on sugar production, producing a commodity on a compact space uh, where, where fresh water's in short supply. So now rum producers uh, are still on the island, uh, on many of the islands, but they have to import their sugar and molasses from farther afield. For instance, on Barbados, which has four distilleries, but no commercial sugar production anymore. It really dried up in the last couple of decades. Uh, now it gets most of its raw material for making rum uh, from Brazil. So in many cases, rum has become the footprint that's outlasted the shoe. I moved to uh, New Orleans in 2006, the same year my rum book came out. And one of the questions I often got from New Orleanians was, that they said, oh, you're a rum guy. What can you tell me about the Louisiana rum industry? The silence that followed was often long and awkward. Uh, for a long time, I assumed I was simply having difficulty accessing the right research, just hadn't found the best resources on the Louisiana rum industry. Uh, at some point, I freed up some time and went on a hunt for those books and articles about rum in Louisiana at the New Orleans Historic Collection, Tulane, the New Orleans Public Library. Found some chaff, but no wheat. Uh, when it comes to uh, rum's offspring, um, you know, and rum was promiscuous, if nothing else, uh, Louisiana just was without spawn. They just couldn't find much information about rum industry or much evidence of it. Like I said, this was curious. Uh, Louisiana had a lot of sugar, as we all know. Louisiana had the technology for producing rum because everyone in the Western Hemisphere at the time had this technology for producing rum, but yet there was no rum industry. Uh, so this profound silence stuck, struck me as sort of the dog in Sherlock Holmes that didn't bark for telling something, but I wasn't sure what. So rather than solving a mystery, it seemed to me that the silence of the, the lack of a rum industry uh, that's produced a mystery. So I, I'd like to look at that a little bit for now. Um, okay. So uh, just sort of take a look at, uh, uh, you know, Louisiana, what happened here, or sort of a more contemporary way of putting it, uh, Louisiana WTF. Uh, so to answer that, I'm gonna take us on a, a detour to the land of context, find out what was happening that may have led to this strange vacuum. And the logical place is to uh, start with sugar, once again. We talked about sugar and its history in the islands last week native to Southeast Asia, traveled west with European traders, eventually moved on to uh, the Canary Islands and then on to the Caribbean in 1493 on Columbus's second voyage. Uh, and here sugar took off, uh, producing not only great amounts of sugar, but also tons of molasses, which was a byproduct of sugar production. Also, as we talked last week, um, the uh, uh, sugar collided with another trend, that, another thing that was happening at the time, that was the rise of distillation. Um, it really is, I like to think of it as a love story. Molasses meant distillation, and they're still going pretty heavily these days. Uh, back then, planters would have employed fairly simple copper stills, likely made with help of the Dutch, who had the technological know-how to boost alcohol content in, in uh, fermented beverages. Um, one of the arguments that, I, as I said, I make in my book is Barbados is the birthplace of rum, and by that I mean commercial rum. It's not that enterprising folks in other countries couldn't figure out how to make rum. The Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese were likely dabbling in it, but rum didn't blossom into a permanent industry uh, and grow from those furtive distillations uh, for those various reasons we talked about last week. Uh, John McCusker, uh, sugar historian, wrote a great book on the history of sugar. Um, notes that sugar didn't so much revolutionize Barbados since its first settlement in 1627, Barbados had really been a commodity island. It produced indigo and cotton, not very successfully in either, but it, it was focused on a commodity production. Uh, but he makes the argument that Barbados revolutionized sugar and really streamlined the process of how sugar was produced and, and shipped. Uh, and that led to the production of more molasses, the byproduct, which led to more rum. Uh, and that formula sort of appeared elsewhere as well. Wherever sugar was grown, rum makers cropped up. And in most places, uh, it, it sort of consolidated and grew from back, backyard production, you know, small scale stills to larger uh, industries to eventually in the 20th century, full grown uh, rum industries. By the middle of the 18th century, much of the West Indies and North America had basically become the Republic of, of Rum, with that one exception, uh, Louisiana. So what was happening in Louisiana? Why did this sort of get overlooked when everybody else was booming with sugar followed by rum? 
Uh, for starters, it wasn't British, so that set it apart. It was French until 1762, Spanish until 1803. And that may have led to a dampening effect on the development of the rum industry, or at least the documentable rum industry, for the same reasons I mentioned last week, including res more restrictions on trade among the Spanish and French than there were uh, with the British colonists. Um, I'd like to look a little bit more systematically at what was happening in each of those key elements. Uh, I talked about sugar production, distillation, and trade uh, that, that all helped fuel the rise of rum elsewhere, all set in the context of, of Louisiana. Sugar came relatively late to Louisiana. The Jesuits first brought cane from present day Haiti in 1751, so a century after it had started to establish itself in the, in the uh, islands. Uh, others have played around with it, but it didn't really catch on or go very far early on in Louisiana for one basic reason, and that was climate. Uh, sugar cane dies quickly if exposed to freezing temperatures. One good winter frost can wipe out your year's investment for a planter if they leave it in the fields for too long. So instead of allowing cane to grow for a full year or 14 months, as it commonly does on the frost-free islands, uh, sugar had to be planted late and harvested early in Louisiana, giving it at most a nine or 10 month growing cycle. Uh, this meant that those complex sugar molecules in the cane hadn't developed as fully as it had in the Caribbean, which meant it couldn't make lovely crystals, which meant that it didn't produce highly valued crystallized sugar. Like I said, you can make cane syrup out of it. Uh, cane syrup had more in common with molasses than with crystallized sugar, so it wasn't valued very highly. Some planters did set up sugar works, but without much success. Uh, one contemporary account noted that sugar making process yielded small amounts uh, in Louisiana and that it, quote, looked like marmalade or guava jelly. Uh, and when they tried to ship it to France, it all oozed out of the barrels. So the sugar from Louisiana, grown in Louisiana, just didn't have much value just because it couldn't be crystallized. That state of affairs persisted until 1794. That's when New Orleans sugar planter um, married into a sugar planting family, got him Etienne de Boré. Uh, he took a hard look at the sugar industry, he experimented with some alternative sugarcane varieties, selecting some early season sugarcane. He brought in an experienced sugar maker from Santa Domingo uh, who knew something of the tricks of the trade. He likely uh, uh, employed a process used on some of the islands involving the addition of lime, that's the mineral, not the fruit, daiquiris didn't come just yet, uh, and that helped uh, crystallize the, the uh, this, the cane syrup as, as, it, as it got denser. Uh, his experiments with sugar raised very high expectations in the city. Uh, a lot of people wanted to see this uh, succeed so that they could develop a sugar industry. The curious uh, would flock to his plantation, which is now where Audubon Park currently is, or we're current, currently where Audubon Park is. Uh, and they just wanted to see what was happening with his uh, experiments. His grandson, who went to become the uh, historian Charles uh, Garay, uh, he wrote, uh, it's a great quote, an immense crowd uh, waited with eager impatience the concentration of the juice to the granulating point and stood with breathless silence to catch his first announcement, it granulates. When announced, the wonderful tidings flowed from mouth to mouth and went dying into the distance as if a hundred glad echoes were telling it to one another. Uh, some uh, hyperbole and fiction might have been involved in this account, but it is known that uh, Etienne de Boré did succeed in crystallizing sugar where others hadn't. Um, in all likelihood, his experiments were aided and driven by the unrest in Haiti, which was started in 1791, that uh, uh, slaves had ridden up and risen up and cast out their French masters. And this reduced the supply of sugar in world markets, and the price was going up. Louisiana probably decided it was then time to fill the void, figure out how to do this, uh, no doubt encouraged by the prospect of higher prices for sugar, despite the fact that they were getting lower yields and had higher expenses in producing sugar. Other new strains of frost resistant cane came in later in the 18th century, early 19th century, and new technology arose, such as steam powered rollers, vacuum pan distillation, and centrifuges, uh, leading to a, a real boom in sugar uh, production in Louisiana. Everything basically from, up from the, the any, har, any arable land south of New Orleans all the way up to Baton Rouge was switched over to sugar cane. It was, it was a boom time. Obviously, uh, we, if you know the history of New Orleans, you know it was the golden age was really ooh, 1800, 1840 or so when, uh, between trade and sugar and cotton being uh, developed up in the Mississippi River Delta, big ship down. It was, it was the boom time and sugar was a big part of it. Um, 
so the lands along the waterway, yeah, they just all became c covered with sugar from Baton Rouge South. And uh, anyone with means uh, at the time could buy some land and get into sugar production did. It was basically an echo of the sugar mania that gripped the Caribbean 150 years earlier. So by the end of the 19th and, uh, or the 18th and early 19th century, there was certainly an abundance of sugar from which to, to make rum. And it turns out there was rum. rum. Uh, in fact, some rum production even preceded the 1794 arrival of commercial sugar in Louisiana. Uh, one sees the word tafia, an historic account of life in the early years. It was a distilled beverage uh, made from sugarcane syrup. Uh, but what exactly it was and how it differed from rum seems to vary from region to region and from era to era. Here you see it on this ad from 1822, offering new rum as well as tafia and gin. Um, it, uh, it, it, in some places, you know, it, it might have just been another word for rum. Obviously here it appears twice, so it's not, it's something different. Uh, but some suggest it might have toffee was just a lesser grade of rum, something not as desirable and, and cheaper. And toffee wasn't confined to Louisiana in 1729, I mean, just a decade after the settlement of New Orleans, Captain Alvin Duplessis sailed from France to colonize New Orleans. And he stopped by Haiti, according to his log books, and he recorded that he picked up toffee in Haiti and brought it onward, not only for sailors to drink, but so that he could have something to sell in New Orleans. Uh, it noted, he noted it, uh, the, the promise of toffee encouraged slaves to work harder and longer. Uh, and the records show that some residents of Louisiana uh, did make rum. Letters from Don Andres Almanastri Roja to Esteban Miro uh, make reference to the um, making of toffee, which they, they uh, are running a toffee still, which they both had an interest in in New Orleans. So when, but the, 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 what it comes down to is that sugar took, really took off in the 1790s after crystallization. Uh, and there's ev some evidence that toffee production stepped up as well there. Uh, Carlisle Stitterson's history of the sugar industry in Louisiana noted that at least a dozen distillers were making toffee in New Orleans and along the river. Uh, one of these distillers reported that his customers included neighboring planters and Abbott, a free black cooper and a mulatto wench. Uh, so it seemed there was an incipient rum industry taking root in Louisiana, but it started small and stayed small. It remains you know, stunted in the locals, best I can tell. It's a little bit like a northern far farmer who decided he would make some uh, little hard cider to sell to his neighbors, uh, and then uh, never grew out of that. It just Even though a fancier technology would have allowed him to do so. Um, so you, You've got that, those elements, and then you've got trade. I mentioned uh, that New Orleans is really in the boom time in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, it's, sugar drove a lot of that. So it's also a little bit mysterious that rum didn't take off since they had access to the trade. They could have moved that uh, anywhere. They could have moved it up the river since 1812, uh, supplying rum upriver. They could have moved river, uh, rum to the Eastern seaboard. Uh, this really could have served as a, the trade, you know, booming trade could have served as a wind to really fan the flames of a rum industry if it had taken off there. The Port of New Orleans was the entrepot for everything moving down the river in the late 19th, you know, in the uh, early 19th century. Um, so the, the rise of sugar and the explosion of trade really should have set the stage by all rights uh, for the rum industry. So what happened? Uh, where are those big rum distilleries that are the birthright of us in Louisiana? So my thinking is that all the pieces were coming together for rum's rise in Louisiana, but just in the wrong order. Everything happened at the wrong time. Uh, rum's potential rise in Louisiana came at just the time it was disappearing from cultural consciousness everywhere else. What happened to the rum was to rum was pretty extraordinary. Uh, as we talked last week, it went from omnipresent to almost invisible in the course of a generation or two. Uh, so rum, it, as the sugar industry was taking off, rum was running into you know, considerable headwinds that were, were growing. Um, you know, once independence was declared in 1776, all the advantages of trading within a single block of colonies vanished. Trade became subject to tariff duties and other inconveniences. And then, as I mentioned, there's the rise of whiskey. Uh, blossomed west of the Appalachians and Alleghenies it was, because it was more economical to ship, to convert grain to whiskey and ship it than it was to ship the grain itself. Uh, so farmers all set up stills and were producing mass amounts of whiskey, which were being shipped to the um, eastern seaboard. So you had whiskey production boomed, uh, price of liquor dropped, and whiskey led the charge on the drop. You can see here on the prices that uh, you could get whiskey for uh, even less than toffee 
uh, and certainly, and it was like quarter the price of Jamaican rum, uh, which was a, a fairly choice and, and somewhat less than the, whatever New Orleans rum was being uh, produced there at the time. So rum tottered, whiskey took over. Um, my book uh, about rum is subtitled, A History of the New World and 10 Cocktails. I make the case that each of the 10 drinks I write about arose because of a confluence of various trends, political, economic, cultural, technological. If one of those trends hadn't happened, the cock that cocktail wouldn't have appeared. I think in the case of Louisiana, what you're seeing is the same thing, a, a number of trends that came together, but poorly coordinated and asynchronous, and it never provided the uh, ability for the rum industry to take off. I think that explains why rum never became a vital part of the Gulf's economic life, even if it did contribute marginally to its social life. And it, in small amounts. The sugar industry was basically 150 years too late to generate much interest in rum. More importantly, to generate the kind of revenue and profits that got the attention of planters throughout the Caribbean from 1640 onward. By the time sugar took off in Louisiana in the last years of the 18th century and the early years of the 19th, um, and when all that molasses was being produced, ready for the fermenters and pot stills, by then rum ship had, you know, by and large had sailed. Uh, the reason why Louisiana, its massive sugar crop, didn't have a major rum production facility and have a major stake in the global rum market today, I think it's basically what on Craigslist they call missed connections. Uh, what occurred along the Gulf has been something of a symphony of missed opportunities in various keys. Louisiana would have had a jump on things if they'd gotten started with the rum industry. They could have planted sugar cane to make syrup exclusively for rum. Uh, in this regard, it seems a bit like the executives of Decca Record having the Beatles come into audition in 1962 and then passing on them to sign up uh, Brian Poole and the Tremolos. Uh, but I want to end up on a somewhat brighter note of opportunities embraced, and that brings us to the past two decades. Uh, America has been amidst a craft spirit explosion around 2005. There were maybe 50 or 60 small distillers nationwide. Today, there are closer to 2,000 out there producing spirits of all sorts. Uh, and Louisiana and sugar country are not missing out this time. This time, it's not a missed opportunity. They seem to have embraced it. In fact, the first craft rum distillery uh, in America appeared in New Orleans, opened in 1995, Old New Orleans Rum, uh, started by the artist James Michaelopoulos. Uh, when I spoke with him uh, a few years ago and asked him why he started a rum distillery, he looked at me as if I were a bit simple in the head and said, well, there was all this sugar around and I thought maybe I should make some rum. Only somebody had said that 225 years ago. I think Louisiana could have been a, a, a rum producer. At any rate, that's what I know about Louisiana rum production, some sketchy facts, a theory. Uh, if anyone feels like taking on a research project and wants to learn more about taffy and rum production, uh, it's, it seems like this would be a pretty open topic and welcome to some uh, digging and exploration. If I ever get around to retiring, and that's, uh, this is on my list of projects to do, sifting through plantation books and municipal records and the like, but I'd, frankly, I prefer somebody beat me to it and figure this out. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the modern Louisiana rums next week when I look at the contemporary rum scene. But now let's, uh, let's turn on to the main topic tonight, which is rum production, both historic and contemporary. Now, first I need a drink. This is growing on me. Coca-Cola is a weird element to put in with coffee and cream, but it works. Um, <clears throat> uh, actually, if, if you're uh, there, Jason, if anybody has any questions about Louisiana and rum, or if they have their own theories, or if anyone's posted anything, I'd be happy to take that now before we move on to the production side of things. But however, if anything comes up later, we can talk about it. Then. Not, nothing yet, unless someone unless someone has something to put in the chat or, or chime in, but nothing right okay. now. Um, so let's go on to how rum is made. We talked a lot about history and how all the historic elements that have led to why rum is like it is, why it tastes like it does in some ways, uh, why it has different elements that come together to, to create this, but it, that's really the history. Now we're gonna sort of look at the biology and the uh, chemistry of rum, how these various things come together to provide rum flavor that we presumably have signed up because you enjoy rum. So I, I think I can say that it's, it's a beverage that we're all enjoying. So how do you make rum? The uh, short, relatively unhelpful answer is that you make it the same way you make whiskey, tequila, brandy, just about any other distilled spirit. Uh, the difference is you start with a different raw material. 
with whiskey, you're essentially making beer. You take grains, you manipulate that grain to turn starch into sugar. Then you let the yeast do its work, uh, converting sugar to ethanol and carbon dioxide. You let the uh, carbon dioxide go free and then you keep the ethanol. And it's all a natural process. And then you use switch to a mechanical process to separate the ethanol from the rest of the water in the, and other ingredients in the mash. Uh, and you, you, you get rid of the water and keep everything else. Same with brandy, you make wine and then you go about stripping it through a still, keeping the part that you don't want and discarding, uh, or keeping the part you want, discarding the stuff that you don't want. Tequila, same. You make pulque by fermenting agave and then concentrate the alcohol through distillation. And with rum, we start with sugar cane. Uh, now I'm gonna go through the process step-by-step step and talk about the variations that can influence the style of rum and thereby its flavor. But let me start with a very brief overview and show you the view as we whiz by on the interstate, and then we'll get off the highway and explore some smaller byways. So here's a quick overview of what we'll be uh, digging into a little bit more this evening. Um, basically five stages, selection of sugar that you're gonna use to make the rum, the fermentation, choice of yeast and how you're gonna ferment it, how long and the like, the actual distillation process, uh, when you strip out the alcohol from the rest of the ingredients and what equipment you use to do that. Uh, the aging, uh, or not, if it's unaged. Where you age it, how long, what barrels you use, all that has an impact on flavor. And then finally, there's the blending and additives to rum, which also influence the, the uh, flavor. But let's, let's start with sugar. <clears throat> Last week, we talked about the history of sugar. Uh, and, and this is the, you know, sugarcane is really the one thing that all rums have in common. Federal requirement in the United States is that rum be a product of sugarcane or its byproducts. So it could be from anything that comes out of sugarcane uh, and is fermented and distilled can be called rum. Uh, historically, rum has been come from other sources. I found uh, colonial accounts of people selling rum made from maple syrup. Uh, more recently, I've seen craft spirits selling rum made from sorghum molasses uh, that's been labeled as rum. I think that was an error by the federal authorities that approved these things. Uh, though a case could be made that sorghum and cane sugar have a common ancestor. Um, I'm not sure where exactly that stands now, but I don't think that you can, it doesn't taste like rum. You shouldn't be labeling sorghum distillate as rum. That's my opinion. Uh, and more importantly for time, uh, rum was made from beet sugar. Uh, you know, it was, this was uh, particularly popular in Europe when Europe discovered in the late 19th and early 20th century that they could grow lots of sugar beets and produce their own sugar. They no longer had to rely on the islands for importing sugar. You know, tons of uh, a sweet liquid made from sugar beets and they could distill that into rum. Uh, again, that just really did not taste like uh, rum very much, but what they typically do is they make a distillate from sugar beet and then flavor it with some high uh, ester rum from Jamaica or elsewhere in the Caribbean. They just uh, blend it in to give it more of a rum flavor and sell it. No longer permitted under EU regs, so uh, everyone seems to be in agreement that rum has to come from sugar cane. So that's, uh, uh, that's where it started. There's, there's hundreds of species of sugar cane, uh, hundreds of uh, varieties of it. Uh, subspecies and different uh, breeds and variations. Um, you can use any kind you want to make rum. Only on the French islands are the types of sugar, the strains of sugar cane specified. Uh, if the producers want to label their rums as the rum agricole of Martinique or Guadeloupe, uh, that's the only place that it's restricted. Otherwise, uh, rum producers can get their molasses or sugar from any variety of cane. That's in theory. In reality, almost all uh, rum comes from a strain of uh, a species of sugar called uh, Saccharum officinarum. About 70% of all sugar in the world comes from this species. Uh, it's been bred and it's, it's got good yields. It can withstand winds. It can withstand uh, fluctuating temperatures quite well uh, and disease. So uh, most of it's from that, that one um, form. So we're uh, you've got sugar cane, starting with sugar cane, and that can, uh, basically there's three common options of which you can then process the sugar cane uh, in order to make the substrate to make the rum. And that is uh, sugar cane juice, molasses, and sugar cane honey. So sugar cane juice, uh, fairly simple. You take, uh, you squeeze the sugar, you cut the sugar cane, you run it through the rollers. It produces a, a whole lot of uh, cloudy juice. It's very sweet. 
Uh, that typically is sent off to be processed to, to make uh, crystallized sugar. As I said last week, the, there's a byproduct from that's molasses. But you can take that juice, not make sugar, and just make rum directly from it. And that is most commonly done in the French islands of Martinique, Guadeloupe, and uh, Marie Gallant. And this was really adapted in the early part of the 20th century. I, I talked about the rise of the sugar beet industry in Europe. And when that happened, uh, the price of sugar plummeted. It became somewhat less viable in the Caribbean to make fortunes producing sugar. Uh, so some in the French islands brought in some cognac makers as consultants, and they basically say, let's develop sugar cane just for rum. We're not developing it for sugar. We don't care about how it crystallizes. We just want to make a good rum out of uh, sugar cane juice. So this agricole, which is French for agricultural rum, they refer to rum from molasses as industrial rum, which doesn't make many producers of molasses rum. Well, they, they don't embrace that term that well. But they, uh, they, uh, they started making rum just from the fresh sugar cane juice, fermenting it directly, not altering it in any way before then. It's a very distinctive taste from the molasses rum. It's, uh, it, it smells like a fresh cut lawn, uh, and it's, it's got a bright, fresh flavor. When I first, when I first was working on my book, when I first had agricole rum from Martinique, I thought, wow, there's something really wrong with this rum. This does not taste like rum. And uh, it took me a while to realize that it's just a different flavor. And I've come to really like it and appreciate it. And it was a trip to Martinique and seeing the process that really helped me understand it. And now I'm a, I'm a big fan of, um, of white agricole rum. The white agricole rum is very bright and grassy. Uh, once it's aged, put it in a barrel for two, three, four, five, six years. Uh, the differences with molasses rum start to narrow as the, the dominance of the barrel takes over. So a common drink in the French islands is tea punch, which stands as short, it's T-I punch, uh, short for petite punch uh, or tea punch. And it's just white agricultural rum along with a little sugar cane and a squeeze of lime and that's it. It's, it's a perfect, it's basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a tropical rum old fashioned. It's really, uh, almost a perfect drink. I, I do love me a tea punch. Um, so th that's the sugarcane rum. Again, mostly uh, focused on the French island. So it's, it's expanding out. We're starting to see a little bit more agricole. We'll talk about that next week with modern rums. Uh, molasses is by far the most common source of material for rum. It's, uh, as I mentioned last week, byproduct of crystallizing sugar. It's available by the, the tanker full. You can order it by the, the barrel tote or tanker. Uh, if you're a rum producer, it's it's not difficult to acquire and it's not that ex expensive. The key difference between that and the sugarcane distillate is that molasses has been boiled. Uh, the sugar has been boiled to reduce it down. So there's some caramelization. There's a burnt bit of a burnt flavor to it, and that carries over somewhat into the uh, the distillation process. The, those sugars just get cooked and caramelized and there's a distinct flavor, a little bit touch smoky, a little bit butterscotchy, what you'd sort of expect with proline uh, flavor in some of them. Um, so that's the, the molasses rum. But again, that's by far and away, I, I, I'm going to have to guess 90, 95% of the world rum market starts as molasses. Uh, sugar cane is fairly small. And the third one is sugar cane honey. Uh, and this is sort of a hybrid between sugarcane juice and molasses. It's uh, one of the problems with doing straight sugarcane juice is that once you cut the cane, uh, you have to process it. You have to run it through the rollers within 24 hours. So the cane starts to deteriorate. It starts to get sour. The sugars start to disappear. Um, and then once you squeeze it uh, through the rollers and you have the juice, you can't hold that either. That has to be immediately put into the fermentation tanks and the process begun right away to uh, ferment it, get it ready for distillation. Because again, it, it, it sours and goes off and it's not as uh, the yields go down. So that's a real problem with uh, agricole rum. It just has to be constant. You have to be right on top of it. Uh, molasses you can store indefinitely and distill when you see fit. Sugarcane honey is basically sugarcane juice that's been boiled down Sugar has not been extracted from it. It's it's same as sugar cane um, syrup in Louisiana, a little bit like Steens. Uh, it's just been boiled down without removing anything from it. That can be set aside and and um, stored indefinitely, so you can distill beyond sugar cane season. I mean, sugar cane season really only runs about four or five months at the best. So that's the only time you can really make agricole rum. If you do boil, if you take the sugarcane juice and boil it down, you can store it in tanks and continue to distill throughout the, 
rest of the year. Uh, it's used by a number of distillers, including uh, Zacapa in, in Guatemala, Rum Barbancor in Haiti, and Richland Rum in Georgia, all use sugarcane honey or sugarcane syrup. These, uh, these, these, these tend to, they, they, they tend to have more in common uh, right off the still with the molasses rum, again, because it has been boiled down. Some of that freshness has been taken away from it and it's got those caramelized uh, uh, flavors that come in there. You get some of that burnt molasses notes and even the sugar cane honey. And I'll, I'll mention a fourth option that I don't have up here because it's fairly minor, at least at, at present, and a bit of an outlier. And that's uh, use raw sugar crystals, uh, what's commonly called evaporated cane juice or ECJ. Uh, it's basically sugar cane honey that's been, then just been crystallized with everything in it. So the molasses hasn't been taken out. It tends to be a little damp and clumpy. Uh, and this is pretty common these days among craft distillers as it's relatively inexpensive and it can be delivered in 50 pound sacks and stored around the distillery fairly easily and then uh, conveyed to the fermenters fairly easily by a uh, strong backed uh, crew. I've had some good rums made from evaporated cane juice. Uh, when it's handled right, it can be done quite well, but more often than not, it's not handled right. And you end up with a rum that lacks much character when you use the ECJ. Uh, it often seems to have more in common with vodka, just something gets lost from it. Uh, a number of uh, smaller distillers have begun rum production with uh, evaporated cane juice, seem to be moving away from it, embracing uh, molasses and, uh, for the most part. So that's the base of rum. Uh, and how you know the sugar in different forms can produce different flavors. Uh, and then what happens next is we get into uh, fermentation. Um, fermentation is really, I think, the least appreciated, the most underrated part of the process of making flavor uh, in rum. Uh, what flavors come out of fermentation depend on a lot of factors. And it's very subtle, very broad. You can make all sorts of different flavors depending on how you uh, ferment it. The type of yeast that you're using, uh, what kind of conditions you're fermenting, whether it takes place in open or closed tanks, whether it's open to the outdoors or not, if it, uh, the, and the temperature at which the fermentation takes place, is it cold fermentation, warm fermentation, that can have, uh, lead to a wide variety of flavors, uh, and also the length of time that, you, that one allows the fermentation to go. Uh, so let me look at a few of those things individually. Uh, start with yeast. Uh, a century or two ago, all distillers were experts with yeast out of necessity. Uh, there were no yeast houses where you could buy packets of yeast like this. They had to grow it, capture it in the environment, propagate it, and store it on the distillery. So there tend to be, I think, a lot more variety among uh, rum makers back in the day when they had their own local yeast that uh, was producing the, the flavors in their rum. It's like a little bit like, I mean, it's thing like sourdough starter. Everyone has their own of that these days. That's fairly easy to keep. But the, uh, the yeast that they, they, they kept for the rum distilleries, they, they wanted to keep that out separate. Always kept a mother batch. Uh, you could use one batch of a previous uh, fermentation to jump, start the next batch or to use it to get it fermenting. But yeast uh, has, has a high proclivity to mutation. Uh, it can change its uh, structure, its genetics. And the flavors then change. So you want to keep a mother batch to, to feed into it. So today, um, yeast tends to be more of a commodity. Uh, a lot of people use uh, something called Red Star, which is a uh, bread yeast that's fairly commonly used uh, on craft distillers and smaller distillers. Bigger distillers have settled into their own approach uh, to it. They, um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, become, it's become more of a commodity. Distillers can just order it from a, from a lab and uh, get a batch four or five times a year just to keep it fresh. What, so what, what exactly are yeasts? They're microscopic single cell strains of fungi. Uh, they like nothing better than to eat sugar, consume the sugar molecules and secrete alcohol and carbon dioxide along with a bunch of other compounds. Uh, it will, the yeast can get into a, a, a batch of sweet mash anything that's uh, got a lot of sugar content, the right temperature, right sugar density, uh, and it can convert it to an alcoholic mash in just a matter of hours. The yeast are voracious and they uh, constantly subdivide and keep producing more till they actually kill themselves. At some point, maybe around uh, nine or 12% alcohol, yeast can no longer survive. Evolutionarily, I'm a little mystified by, by uh, something that evolved to eat and, and subdivide 
voraciously until it kills itself. But I, I don't know. Some another another retirement project. Figure out why that's the why that's the case. Uh, yeast strains began, as I said, local and wild. Uh, the distillers would harvest them locally. Uh, many of the you know, more popular ones are called the uh, Saccharomyces uh, yeast that are used for distilling. And those tend to be uh, found on, on, oak, on oak bark, for instance. Uh, and those that produce distinct flavors can be isolated and cultivated by labs for use in beverage production. Uh, while there are <clears throat> 10 known species of Saccharomyces, there are hundreds of minor strains of these varying on their ecological niche, mutations, and evolution that distillers might count on for uh, producing their, their rum. Um, as I said, each of those produce different flavors, and they also produce other elements besides uh, ethanol or alcohol and carbon dioxide. The yeast also produce aldehydes, acid, ketones, and these other compounds that, that provide flavor. They can yield fruity, floral, green grass, soapy, sulfur, and herbal notes in a, in a, in a bunch. Among the leaders in doing uh, yeast studies, and this is out of rum and into whiskey, uh, in the 1940s and 50s was the Seagram's Corporation. They had isolated and propagated 240 different types of yeast. Some of these uh, live on. Uh, Four Roses whiskey is notable. It has um, five strains of yeast that it uses regularly now that are descendants of these 240 strains. Uh, and they produce now at their, in their Kentucky distillery 10 different distillates uh, using five different mashes and two different mash bills um, to, uh, to, 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 to create this palette of 10 different distillates that they can then blend and mix for the flavors they want. I, I tells of the cocktail, uh, I think it's four or five years ago, I was involved with a panel, on a panel about uh, distillation. And we had um, White Labs, which is one of the leading yeast producers for brewers and distillers out of San Diego. They produced four, I guess four or five barrels of beer. The only difference was that uh, everything was identical except for the yeast, so you could tell the difference in the taste of the yeast. You know, actually, you can go to their, uh, I don't know if it's open to the public or just for commercial, in San Diego and sample these beers so you can tell the difference that the yeast make uh, in beer. But they shipped them up to St. George Spirits in San Francisco, these four kegs, and uh, Lance Winters, the distiller there, ran them through the still, and and created a, it was not, not a, mount, a large amount, maybe a bottle or so of uh, distillate from each keg and then brought them to tails and we sampled, everyone got to sample the four different kinds of uh, whiskey that were made from four different kinds, the only variable being the yeast. And the, and the differences are quite striking. Uh, so yeast is really something that is, uh, is not, doesn't get, doesn't get the, the attention I think that it should uh, for the most part. You'll often hear of places that uh, say they use wild yeast in their production. Uh, they make a big claim about that as part of their marketing. It makes for good marketing, but it doesn't really exist in the production of commercial spirits. Big vats of molasses just aren't gonna ferment quick enough if you're gonna let yeast blow in through the window and settle in the vat. Uh, it can add, you, can, you know, a lot of these open vat production facilities they are open. I know there's the, I think it's the West Indian Rum Distillery in Barbados is, they're outdoors, open to the sky. Bert, and they, the, the guy showing me around said, yeah, sometimes birds just die and fall in. Uh, certainly, I assume they poop in it as well, but it doesn't really matter. It's distilled out. It's, 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 all, it's all cleaned out. But it's, uh, there, there is wild yeast coming into that, but they also use, they also add yeast, uh, pitch yeast into the fermentation because they need to get it through in a few days. And it's just not going to happen with wild yeast. So if you see a place that advertises uh, wild yeast, then it's, it's, it's probably marketing. I mean, there are, I mean, Nissan and Martinique, a great maker of rum, they, uh, they use three main yeast strains. And they, uh, they found them, they got them off of the plants uh, right around the distillery, found the ones that they like, and then had these uh, isolated and shipped to France, where they are propagated and stored, kept in ideal conditions, and shipped back as they need them. So it's based on a well of yeast, but it's, it's really a cultivated. Uh, it's sort of startling to see the interest in yeasts that have been cropping up among consumers. It's always been really invisible, but I think in the last oh, five years or so, people have been paying attention a little bit more to yeast. Uh, craft beer has certainly helped with that education. Uh, we're starting to see more of it with craft spirits as well. People understanding that yeast matters. People go into a bar and ask a, a bartender or a brewer, what, what kind of yeast are you using in this beer? Um, 
there's, there's one I know of Hard Truth Distilling, and uh, it's a rum maker in Nashville, Indiana. Uh, they've acquired a yeast strain from rum distilleries in the Caribbean uh, that are used for making Caribbean rum. They claim that that brings fruity tropical notes to their rum. I haven't tried it, so I'm not sure, but they're, they're, they're savvy enough to know that they can include that in their marketing now. So the main job of yeast is to make alcohol. That's job number one. Take the sugar, sweet, syrupy um, wash and turn it into alcohol because that's what we're going to sell. But it also moonlights as a flavor producer, uh, creating some of those notes that you like in your fermentation rum, uh, your, in, your, uh, in your favorite rums. Um, also, you know, I, well, we'll skip over that uh, for now. I don't want to, we can geek out about any of this stuff forever, but I won't. The um, next. Hey Wayne, is there is there a place you can buy sugar cane juice or rum agricole in New Orleans? I uh, sugar cane juice probably not. I think you can get sugar cane syrup um, possibly at Keefe's, uh, maybe at Martin's. I know that Ed Hamilton has been producing sugar cane syrup, and that's used for sweet and tea punch. Uh, as far as agricole, that's becoming more widely available. Again, Keith Martins, uh, Dornyaks, all should be carrying uh, some of the uh, better agricole rums. We'll talk about those next week. Um, there's, uh, there's still, I think, last count, there were still seven distilleries on Martinique, and most of them making agricole style rums. So we'll, we can talk about that next week. Um, but if people want to shop around for them, yeah, JM. Nissan, Clement, La Favorite, St. James, De Paz, all, uh, all solid rums. I like Martinique rums. So the, um, you've got, yeah, once you've got the yeast, you've got the, the means of fermentation, what kind of, what kind of conditions you're fermenting in. Uh, closed fermentations are possible and sealed stainless steel tanks. It tends to be more like a laboratory with all the conditions are under control. That's common with many of the larger producers who want to turn out hundreds of thousands of bottles, all being consistent flavor. The open fermentation, which you see here in, in Jamaica and Barbados, that is, um, it allows the yeast, and a lot of the yeast that have naturally propagated over the course of, could be 100, 200 years, the case of uh, Mount Gay uh, since 1703, uh, these yeasts live in the distilleries, like uh, Hamden Estates and uh, which maybe we'll talk about next week in Jamaica. It's just an amazing distillery. It's just like gaps in the roof, beams falling down, spiders and webs everywhere. They're like, don't touch the spiders. Spiders, may, the webs might have stuff that we need for to fall into the tanks and to help uh, create the flavors, which are, tend to be very unique there. So the, the open tank fermentation is, I, I just love seeing these, uh, these big tanks open to the outdoors like this. In this case, they're covered o overhead, but they're still, the windows are wide open to allow things to come in. I mean, that, that shot to the lower right shows you how little has changed in the last 300 years. I think last week showed shot of open tank fermentation in Barbados in the 1700s, and it looked pretty much like this, with the exception that they didn't have the flooring built out. I mean, these tanks are not four feet high. These tanks are 20 feet high, and these are just flooring built around it, and they extend well below it. So it's a little bit more modern in that way, but not much. But it, it continues to allow the air to bring in the natural yeast just to add that little bit of nuance and flavor uh, to it. Also, I think uh, the temperature at which yeast, uh, temperature at which fermentation takes place has a, ma a major uh, impact on flavor. Cooler temper, temperature might yield a drier, crisper product when it goes through the still, where a warmer batch could accentuate some of those fruitier notes. And good distillers know how to work with this and, and uh, experiment with it. And then there's the, perhaps more, more importantly, the length of fermentation. Many of the big producers have it nailed down to two or three days. I think average probably mostly can, can take one of these massive 20,000 gallon uh, tanks full of molasses and water and have it completely fermented in three days with some very, really uh, supercharged yeast in ideal conditions. Uh, and the, the idea for them is to move it through as quickly as possible to free up the tanks for another batch of fermenting. Uh, it's just, it's, a, it's efficient. But by leaving it for a much longer fermentation, you get very different flavors. They're bigger, rounder, more robust, fruitier. Uh, and that's in large part because fermentation uh, process not only involves yeast, but also bacteria in a couple of ways. And when you leave it open like this, you're inviting not only the yeast in, but also bacteria. Bacteria is sort of a good news, bad news sort of situation. The good news is it can produce its own flavors when microbes start going after the sugars and 
uh, the alcohol and the other elements in a product that it likes. Some of these are desirable, some of these are not. Classic example, of course, is wine. Yeast producers, yeast can produce lovely wine, uh, but and when it's when, when it attacks the sugars found in mashed grapes, but you leave it out long enough, and the acetobacter bacteria uh, invades, and they start consuming the alcohol, and it produces acetic acid, which of course is vinegar. Uh, in some cases, having at least trace trace amounts of some of these acids is a plus. Uh, you don't want to drink it right in the mash. It might be a little uh, sour or bitter. But once you put it through the distillation process and you put it into the barrels, chemically it starts to mix. It gets introduced to other elements, which then combine and create uh, desirable flavors. And one example that's um, sometimes brought out is butyric acid. Um, yeast or bacteria can produce butyric acid during the fermentation process. And the uh, problem with that is it smells like baby vomit. Uh, this is not especially desirable in rum to have uh, baby vomit smell. But if you combine that with ethanol in the, uh, after the distillation process, uh, there's a chemical bonding that takes place over time. And this creates something called ethyl butyrate, a chemical compound which has a smell of like overripe pineapple, very dense and, and rich. And that can be really welcome in the right amounts in uh, a lot of rums. If you're familiar with some of the rums of Jamaica or Guyana, uh, that seems to be one of the common rums. I think they've got the ethyl butyrate dialed in. Um, <clears throat> so that means with yeast and bacteria, you're really playing three-dimensional chess. You need to not only think of the flavors that you're producing right then and there, but then how those compounds that you're producing, the acids, the esters, the cogeners, uh, will go on to ultimately morph and combine with other elements uh, further down the process and distillation and aging. So once you've created your wash, it's filled with all sorts of interesting and obscure flavors, some immediate and some designed to blossom in the future. Uh, you then get ready to move on to the stills and you let uh, the, in the stills you're basically just separating out the flavors you want from those that you don't want. So we've, uh, Moving on to, to distillation and um, you know, making alcohol is a, is a natural process. It's not a man-made process. You just leave something out, it's going to turn to alcohol because the yeasts are in the air and the yeast are going to find that sugar. Uh, the yeast are sort of the original nanobots uh, that just are tirelessly uh, going at and, and rearranging molecules um, because they want to. Uh, they're, they're taking that sugar and making it into alcohol and carbon dioxide. But the added bonus for distillers is that they, uh, yeast is abundant and it will work for free. Uh, so you can get, like I said, 9 or 12% alcohol without much effort uh, or much uh, complication. But if you want to get it beyond that, then it goes from being a natural process to being a mechanical and man-made process. So distillation is really the means of separating out fractions of the li liquor liquid by means of boiling points. So if you allow a liquid with high sugar content to get invaded by wild yeast, these uh, fungi convert that into, like I said, something about nine or 12% alcohol. And then you need to get, you want to get the alcohol out and leave a lot of what uh, is behind. So alcohol boils at 186 degrees Fahrenheit, water at 212. So if you start boiling it and capture the vapors, uh, the early vapors are higher in alcohol than the the, the, the later vapors. Uh, and at the very end, yeah, so if you start distilling, you capture alcohol at the outset, boils off first, and we'll get into this a little bit more because there are, there are early alcohols, lighter alcohols that come off first that you don't necessarily want. Uh, and then you get the good alcohols, the ethanol that you do want. And then as it gets to the bottom, you get the heavier, what are called fusel oils, um, at, the, at the end of the distillation process before it turns into entirely water, before you're just getting steam. Uh, and you don't really want the fusel oils either. You want a little bit, they're called the heads, the hearts, and the tails uh, that come off as you boil through. As you go from 186 degrees to 212 degrees, different elements uh, come off at different temperatures. And uh, you, you, you want the hearts, but you also might want a little bit of the heads and a little bit of the tails just to add body and flavor. So the, uh, not only you catch the alcohol, but they're also something called uh, cogeners that are produced in fermentation. These are uh, compounds such as uh, a fufarol, acetaldehyde, methanol, again different types of alcohols in many cases, some that you want, some that you don't. Um, but they, uh, but when you distill, distill, you're basically picking out what you want and what you don't want. Uh, for instance, the, the fufarol, which 
tends to arise when you're cooking sugar. It's something that's naturally produced then. It's got a nutty, caramel, sort of bready taste to it, which is great in limited amounts, but too much of that can really be bitter and unpleasant. So what you really want to do is select which cogeners you're bringing over and which ones you're going to reject, and a distillation does that. And very generally speaking, there are just two types of stills in which rum is made. There's pot stills and there's column stills. There's some, well, we won't get into detail. I'm speaking very generally. Pot stills are very ancient technology. Um, here's uh, Mount Gay, uh, one of their early ones. Um, the guy who showed me around here, this was uh, 15 years ago when I was researching the book. He, everything he pointed to, I'd ask him when it was dated from, he said it was from 1703, which clearly it was not. But even a concrete building, I asked him at one point when that dated to, and he said 1703. Still an early, early uh, technology. Early pot stills were um, very basic, but if, a, if an alchemist from the 1500s walked into Mount Gay today, he would look at that and say, oh, you're making alcohol. <laughs> it really hasn't changed all that much. Uh, you know, the main difference between the two, pot stills are done by the batch, column stills are done continuously. So here's the pot still technology. Um, you fill up the alcohol wash on the, on the left there into a, a, a big pot that has a, usually sort of an onion shaped head on top of it. You can see how it recycles some of the, the uh, liquid it goes around it, which is helpful to it. So you start boiling it. Uh, the alcohol vapor goes up first. It moves over into what's called a worm or a coil, uh, and that's a uh, con condenser. And that runs through cold water, which condenses the vapor back into liquid, and then that's captured in a receiver. It's a very stripped down and basic version of it. The um, disadvantages of pot stills, and here's, uh, here's some pot stills uh, more industrial sized in Jamaica. Uh, the disadvantage of pot stills are the inefficiency. They're, they're slower, they take more work between batches. You've got to, uh, you've got to clean them or you get fouled spirits. Uh, you typically have to run them through twice to get the alcohol up above 40%. Upper left shot shows a, uh, well, both of these are uh, Jamaican pot stills with double retorts that helps uh, concentrate the alcohol in a subsequent stage. So you don't have to run it through twice, but it's, uh, it's still less efficient. The advantage of pot stills is the inefficiency because that results in more of the native flavors uh, produced by the yeast being transferred over. Um, so you get some of those cogeners that we were talking about to produce those like pineapple and uh, caramel flavors that, that can come over. So, um, <clears throat> you know, in general, the, 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 the less efficient you are, that is through longer fermentations, through slower fermentations, uh, through slower distillation, uh, the more flavor you're gonna get. Vodka is quick and clean. That comes through a column still, always, usually a very tall one. Uh, the better whiskeys, rums, tequilas, and mezcals tend to be a, a slower uh, process. So that's the, the pot still technology, which is used uh, to make rum and uh, uh, still quite widely, especially in Jamaica, uh, Barbados, Trinidad. I'm actually, I'm not sure. We'll get, it, we'll get into this a little bit more next week when we talk about specific rums, so get some more information on, on these. The, um, Column still was uh, invented in the 1840s, the predecessor of the column still by a guy named Anias Coffey in Ireland. And he figured out how to create a still such that you don't have to do it in batches. You can just continuously uh, distill. It doesn't stop. You can just keep putting it in and it comes out. The, um, see if you can see here, starts with the analyzer column. Watch well, it starts up with the, the, the cold, the, the fermented product right here. And that is fed through the rectifier column just to heat up. You see it goes from, from blue to red, just heating up, comes into this column. Uh, and what you have each here are plates and each of these plates have perforations in them. Uh, you have steam being pumped in here. So it's, the steam rises, so it's hotter at the top, cooler at the bottom. You have the wash that comes in. Uh, and as it falls through here, again, it's a mix of water and alcohol and up higher, where the steam is hotter, the alcohol comes off. So the alcohol will come off and through this line. The water comes down, you can adjust it such that most of the water just falls through to the bottom and goes out as waste. So you're just stripping the alcohol out here. And it's further refined, a similar process, same process, but just second time. Over here in the rectifier column, again, these perforated plates. Um, the the uh, steam is coming over here and uh, it's being combined with uh, the uh, alcohol is being combined with the steam. And as it goes through, 
it, you get, it strips out. So you get, as I mentioned, you've got the heads, the lighter alcohols, they come out off the top because they're the lightest and will stay vaporized through uh, the, all the levels up here. And at the bottom, you get the tails coming out, the ones that are, are, are coming out earlier, they're heavier and they're, uh, they're, they're take a lower boiling point to, to come off. And then right in the middle, you've got your uh, spirit, the spirit outlet, what they call here a spirit or what we call the, the hearts. Uh, come off the middle. So it, it's continuously going in. It's just continuously, continuously running. The uh, uh, main advantage of, let's, yeah, that's the um, column. This is a couple of column stills in Jamaica. Not all pot stills in Jamaica. It's the Clarendon distillery, which is uh, fairly new and fairly impressive. Massive, it's like three-story high uh, columns. That the, the Molasses uh, wash is just pumped through continuously pretty much on these, uh, produces huge amounts of, uh, of rum. You get it uh, end up all around the world uh, in a bunch of different bottles and brands. So the um, main advantage of the column still is you can produce vast industrial quantities of alcohol this way. Like I said, some of these are massive. Um, they're just not producing the dense rum Jamaican is known for, but more, they tend to be more the cleaner, lighter, rums that could then either be blended with a pot still rum to create medium body rum or to sold to bottle uh, to producers who bottle them as lighter rums. So it's a, the two main stills, pot and column, uh, both of which produce different flavor profiles or can. Technology has gotten so good that uh, you, the, the column stills can now produce flavors that more or less mimic some of the pot still stuff about how the temperatures are adjusted and where they pull off the alcohols. I don't it's still different than batched, but it's it's getting pretty close. Uh, you don't have the direct heat on it, so it's it's uh, that's the main difference. So anyway, you've got the two types of still, and I want to mention a third kind, which is the hybrid still. These are fairly common in the world of craft cocktails and craft spirits. You see these in a lot of smaller distilleries. This one is uh, we're proud to rum, we're proud to rum still up in Massachusetts. You see a, a pot like uh, still on the left, it's done in batches that comes, uh, goes through. And then on the right is a condenser column or a column, uh, I'm sorry, not a condenser column, a column still that uh, you can then go right from the pot into the column and, 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 and refine it that way. So this is pretty much standard in craft distillers now because it offers a fair amount of, of um, leeway. You can do what you need to do in it. You can bypass the column if you want, or you can just use uh, the column in some cases, and the way some of them are configured. So it's, it offers a lot of versatility. Um, things are sort of combining, I guess. It, it, historically, there was pot still, there was column still. Now things are sort of combining in, in ways that are a little harder to uh, separate separate out. So um, yeah, this is, this is what you're going to see in most uh, distilleries. This is, uh, I think dogfish on the right is making rum. Whistle pig is making rye up in Vermont. It's, uh, that, was, that just went in, I think, four years ago. So, um, so just to 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 recap on on uh, on this, you've got the uh, you've got the flavors. They're largely produced from sugarcane. What do you decide to use? The fermentation. Uh, in the yeast, how you go about fermenting it, you're creating flavors in both of these stages. And then when you get to the distillation, you're creating some flavors marginally, but more you're selecting flavors. You're just using that to pick, we'll take some of this, we'll take two of those, three of those, none of those, none of those, and, and deciding what you want. Then there's uh, uh, one other tool, um, you know, wait, there's more, there's more to creating flavor and, uh, and particularly when it comes to the aged rums and that is the, the aging process. In fact, uh, all the things we talk about that so far that bring flavor to rum, the sugar base, the fermentation time, uh, the yeast, the choice of still, uh, all that might up add up to less than half of the flavor components in, a, in an aged rum. The aging brings a lot of flavor to most spirits, particularly whiskey, particularly bourbon, for a specific reason, which is that bourbon has to be aged in new oak barrels and it's often compared, new oak barrels, it's compared to using the tea bag the first time versus the second time. Once you use a barrel once, you've taken a lot of the flavor out of it and then moves on. Bourbon has to go into a new one. So I, I, I've talked to a number of bourbon, I haven't, I haven't got anyone in the rum world to tell me really what they think as far as the percentages go. But in the whiskey world, in the bourbon world, I've, 
I've talked to probably a dozen different distillers and I've heard everything from 50% of the flavor in a bottle of bourbon comes from the barrel to 80% uh, of the flavor comes from, from barrels. So barrels are, are uh, surprisingly important and I am perhaps inordinately fascinated by barrels. You know, I hope you'll excuse me for my, my enthusiasm on these and, and going on about this. The, um, these are the uh, barrels up in the Zacapa barrels and uh, display barrels on the right and the actual aging barrels done vertically on pallets and the back uh, and, the, and the left. Um, so barrels for, uh, barrels are used for aged rum, but not all rum is aged, obviously. You, everyone here I'm sure has had aged rum as well as white rum. Um, but even the white rums tend to spend some time sitting. Uh, they, they, they need to rest for a bit. There's some of the more volatile elements that some of the, those lighter alcohols that make it through the distillation process. It might have a smell of nail polish, which you don't want when you uncork a, a bottle of, of white rum. Um, you, want, you want some of that to get out. So most rum distillers will at least put it in a big steel tanks like this that, that be vented and they just let it sit for uh, maybe three months, maybe more. Puerto Rico, for instance, requires all rum producers that are making white rum to let it sit for three years. You cannot label it as rum. I guess you can label it as aguardente or something uh, if you don't let it sit for three years, but it has to sit for that three years in order to be labeled rum. That just lets it outgas and develop a little more, um, get rid of some of the less noxious elements and let some of the chemical reactions that occur naturally and slowly over time take place in the rum. Uh, to combine and add some complexity uh, to it. So um, let's talk a little bit more. That's, that's the white rums. White rums are fine. Nobody, nobody gets excited about them. Um, some are great. I, I really like a lot of them. <laughs> I don't need to be dissing them here, but I'm really interested in age drums because the, the interactions that take place in barrels, I think are, uh, are wildly fascinating. Now, barrels used for whiskey, uh, rum aging, or vast majority, again, uh, just molasses probably accounts for 90% of the distillate in rum. I'm thinking uh, the 90% of the barrels used in aging rum are bourbon, ex-bourbon barrels. Um, reason is fairly simple. They're, they're cheaper than getting new barrels uh, because bourbon people, producers can only use them once, they then sell them right after so after four or five years, they're sold. And it, more importantly, rum likes a used barrel. Uh, it's been worn in a little bit by the bourbon. Um, it's not as robust, rum is not as robust as a grain liquor and standing up to the elements of oak. And it, it, it does a little better with uh, oak that's been broken in. It's oak that's had a little bit of, uh, uh, a little bit of, a little bit of age on it. The, um, I mean, barrels, Again, get back to fascination of barrels. They've got a bad rap. I think people, the common 19th century expression was someone was dumber than a barrel full of hammers. Uh, barrels just seem big, stupid, not very glamorous. But I think they're incredibly ingenious in so many different ways. Um, if there's anything you come away with tonight, I hope it's a renewed respect for the, the barrel. Uh, just as the yeast are, as I talked about with the original nano workers making alcohol, barrels are really the nano factories that radically change uh, all liquors, including rum, uh, using methods that you can't even detect from outside the barrel. So here's a barrel diagram. I mean, you have to understand the ubiquity of barrels. They were, you know, over the course of history, they were used for everything. They were the cargo containers of the 19th century. Uh, they were the equivalent of a steel cargo container or the corrugated cardboard box, it's something we take for granted, but there's a real evolutionary genius in them. One historian has likened their invention to the uh, invention of the wheel, it really revolutionized cargo transport in the early 16th, 17th, 18th century in ways that we really take for granted. Barrels likely first surfaced uh, at the base of the Alps in Italy. They were hollowed out tree trunks with animal skins on the either end. These left a taste, so over time, craftsmen learned to fashion heads out of wood from them. And then they learned how to make them out of staves rather than a single piece of wood. Uh, these were held together ingeniously with the, with hoops. By the first century BC, historical record shows that wooden barrels were used across Europe uh, for wine, beer, milk, uh, butter, and water. So they're 
there are uh, aspects to them that I think are really brilliant that, again, take for granted. There's durability. Um, barrels are, are basically two sets of arches. There's, you know, so like they're, they're whoop, I'm going to go back. They're wider at the middle than they are at the end. So there's a, a longitudinal or latitudinal arch that runs this way. Then, of course, going around, it's just a series of arches held together. So, so you've got double arches, so they're extremely durable. Um, any shock, you drop a barrel, and that shock is distributed all around uh, the, the barrel, preventing it from cracking. I mean, the, the, uh, it's not a coincidence that people were going over Niagara Falls in a barrel. They were the most durable thing out there. They're also super maneuverable. They're really a container on wheels. It rolls on an edge when standing up. If you've been to a Cooperage, you see, or a distillery, you can see people still doing that. It's tilting a little bit and rolling it uh, as they go. And when it's on its side, it rolls quite easily because of the arch. It's very uh, light connection with the ground so it, it starts rolling easily and it can spin on a dime so you can turn it very easily um, and once it's on its side a, a moderately skilled person can get it upright just by rocking it a couple of times and pulling it up by the, the chine and because of the way that has the, the chines at the end the indent you can put hooks on them so that they could be uh, done with block and tackle to get on and off ships quite easily as well without any you know extra uh, bother which is a, a fairly simple crane um, reusability, they, uh, with the, head, the heads on them, can, you can pop the hoops off the ends, pull the heads off, and then clean them out and, or char them to get the old flavors out, and then reseal them uh, when they're done. The, it's interesting, the, this ubiquity today, everyone talks today about barrels, uh, the same way we refer to cocktails, like when you know, our forebears had daisies, slings, juleps, and everything described what they're drinking, we just talk about cocktails, same way with barrels. Back then, everyone had different uh, vocabulary to describe barrels. And you, you, the Cooper's output had a whole uh, list of different types of names. Today, I think it reads like a hobbit genealogy. Some of the types of barrels were the, the uh, kinder kilns, runlets, piggins, firkins, hogshead, butts, punchins, tons, queen's pipe, keeves, gear, cask, tub, tears, and tank. Uh, if you've been to a bottle dump and pulled out a ketchup bottle or a pickle jar, you knew what was in it. Uh, because of its shape and some of the, the faceted ketchup bottle or the barrel shaped pickle jar. You, uh, it was like that with barrels. You could know at a glance what was in them, whether it was nail kegs, powder kegs, whiskey barrels, flour barrels, pork barrels, salt barrels, all slightly different. They had different hoops, different thickness of staves. Um, and, and sometimes uh, by law, for instance, a potash barrel had to be exactly 30 inches high by uh, the federal government or said that. One uh, quick aside. You know, barrels really peaked in the, la in the late 19th, early 20th century, thanks in large part to beer being shipped and stored in wooden barrels. In 1918, uh, more than uh, 8 million staves were on the records for being shipped out of New Orleans alone. Uh, but then barrels fell out of fashion. Steel drums, tin cans, cheap, black, you know, cheap uh, glass jars, plastic containers, and cardboard boxes, um, followed by the, the uh, steel cargo container made the barrels more or less extinct. Uh, one place that held on to barrels was the wine and liquor industries, and that's for two reasons. One was because of the uh, the uh, the flavor it imparted to a large part, and it was uh, and it also because the dying cooperage industry managed one last gasp before it was pushed out of extinction. It managed to get the federal government to legally define bourbon, as I mentioned, something made in new oak barrels, which created a steady. Uh, market for new barrels as well as a thriving secondary market for used bourbon barrels. I do want to mention this guy here is working on the barrel. Uh, guy's name is Ron Rasselis. Uh, he's in New Hampshire at Strawberry Bank, a historic village there. He makes barrels for a living at this history village. Uh, he's pretty low-key except when you get him talking about uh, eight, the galvan, you know, what he sees in the movies. He, he gets so worked up about galvanized hoops on 18th century barrel or nail kegs used for liquor, uh, especially gunpowder kegs with iron hoops. Uh, they were always wooden hoops because they, they didn't want them to bump into each other and spark. Uh, he was just disgusted by what he saw in the movies for the most part. Um, if you ever get up there, I think he's still there. Just get by and, you can go by and talk barrels for a while. So the, um, yeah, as I said, used for everything of uh, transport. Here we got these metal barrels. No, there's wooden barrels. I think wooden and metal here. 
anyway, the, uh, the the great discovery of barrels was that, and it was I believe it was completely accidental. When things when you shipped spirits from one place to another, whether it's from Europe to America, America to Europe, or from uh, a, a barrel of whiskey from from Indiana down to New Orleans. It always tasted better when it arrived than when it left. So people started figuring out, what is it? Barrels were doing something here. Uh, and what is it? You know, like I said, barrels seem like dumb and inert objects, but they're, they're very much alive. There's complex reactions going on inside. That is the barrel sits in it. Um, and it's got unique, really unique qualities among them under certain weather conditions. Uh, they can be more permeable to water molecules than alcohol molecules, such that the liquor in them becomes uh, uh, higher proof over time. Uh, and in higher humidity environments, more alcohol evaporates and lower humidity, more water evaporates. So there's some interesting things going on there. So broadly speaking, barrels do two things uh, with, when liquor sits in them. They provide flavor, very complicated layers of flavor. Uh, like I said, they're a bit like tea bags. Uh, there's elements in the wood, the lingons and the uh, hemicellulose. Uh, when those are toasted or charred, they produce these complex sugars that uh, caramelize and, and change in composition and add a layer of flavor. Uh, but they also aid in that other complex reactions. The pores in the woods are such that oxygen and some other molecules can enter, uh, as well as through the stave joints, which are not perfect. Um, it's tight enough that liquid doesn't escape, but gases can still come in. This allows complex oxidation to take place over time, in part by creating some of those complex esters that I talked about, mixing with some of the, uh, the acids and the like. Uh, all sorts of things are happening inside a barrel due to the semi-permeability of it. It's easy to re recreate the flavor of wood with wood chips or smaller barrels, which increase surface area. But the oxidation over time, the slow chemical processes that take place in a barrel, that's proven to be a lot harder to duplicate. Uh, a lot of people are trying, but nobody's been very uh, successful with that. Um, so what makes up the wood is also influences much of the flavor and the spirit. Uh, to simplify wood overly much, there's skeleton and there's muscle. The skeleton is the cellulose that forms a rigid structure where you find elements like lignin. lignin. Uh, and different tree species have vastly different chemical structures resulting in very different flavor profiles. Uh, think of wood chemistry as being like a cocktail itself. Uh, you're looking for balance from the elements in the barrel. Pine barrels tilt way too far toward a resiny taste from the sap, and you don't want that unless you're making retsina. A hickory barrel has a lot of flavors, but it can be a little bit overpowering and strong. It turns out that the perfectly balanced wood is white oak, uh, which is different than red oak, which is not used in barrels because it has a very bitter flavor to it. White oak has just the right amount of tannins, which is a polyphenol with a sharply acrid and bitter taste that we often associate with tea. You want some of that, just like a few drops of bitter in a cocktail, not too much, and, and the uh, white oak helps provide that. White oak has other elements that inject flavors like uh, vanilla and tobacco in it. And it's got a lot of natural sugars that come into play, adding a trace of sweetness uh, that can also be manipulated by burning or toasting the barrel. Um, yeah, the process of making a barrel early on is that you put the staves over heat to make them pliable so they can be bent. Uh, steam eventually displaced that and it lost the taste. So it's sort of a two-stage process took over in cooperage. Uh, the, uh, you, you first steam bend them and then you char them or toast them later. The heat does two things. It breaks down those hemicellulose uh, molecules, which is a complex carbohydrate that helps give the wood its structure. Uh, it breaks down into natural sugars. It, the heat then caramelizes those sugars, uh, which brings that sort of creme brulee or butterscotch flavor to a lot of uh, uh, good good spirits. And again, as I said, bourbon is used uh, uses new barrels, so you tend to get much more of that in bourbon than you do in others. The uh, so that's an overview of how barrels came to be, and, and briefly what's going on inside of the barrels. And and once. I don't think I've said this, but once the bourbon companies use them once, they put them on the open market and uh, one of the big buyers is rum. Everybody buys them. Scotch buys a lot of them. Tequila, brandy, they all want the bourbon barrels because they, uh, the other ones also work quite well with, with basically used barrels. It helps uh, dampen the flavor. So a lot of that ends up down in, uh, in the Caribbean. You'll see a lot of Jim Beam, Jack Daniels, and other, other barrels down there. Finally, on... Um, 
uh, barrels. Uh, there's a few minor elements of things which I, I classify under marketing uh, rather than a significant influence on taste. Uh, Solera, you see this on some labels now. Uh, Zacapa, I think maybe it's changed to Solera style. But a Solera is, you might, I, I think it was Zacapa more accurately described as a dynamic blending process based on the Solera, which I think I have seen in print. But Solera is used for sherry. Uh, it's basically, you've got several tiers of barrels. You start out, uh, fill the top barrels, let them age for a while, move half of those down to the second tier, refill the top one with new distillate. Um, and over time, you end up moving it down. So half of each tier gets down into the second one. And then you let, after a number of years, however many, six, eight years, you start taking the distillate out of the bottom tier of barrels. So it's been a sort of graduated aging. Every level has a little bit from the level above, starting with new and ending up with old. And over time, people will claim that oh, some of the Solera, some of the stuff in the bottom level of a Solera might be 100 years old. You're getting 100 year old liquor out of it. And technically you are, there might be a few molecules in there that are 100 years old, but for the most part, it's been uh, topped up over every, every few years. So you see Solera used a lot in the, the increasingly in the liquor industry, it's moving from the uh, sherry industry into liquor. So, but just be, it's, it's always good if you meet a distiller who claims Solera to ask them specifically what they mean by that. The other thing you see is like single barrel or small batch. I think that's sometimes questionable in, in the rum world. I think a little bit more, it's, it's getting a little more responsible, but in the, in the whiskey world, it seems solid. In the rum world, I'm always mystified by, see, you can see case after case of say Crucian rum that claims to be single barrel, but every, the consistency of color and flavor is a little bit suspect, it seems to me. Also uh, Angostura markets a single barrel rum. So I think some of the smaller distillers are actually doing uh, single barrels uh, when they're doing it. The difference between single barrel and, 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 and standard uh, rum would be just that everything in that bottle comes from one barrel. You can, when a barrel is full, it can hold, holds maybe 250 bottles. Uh, over evaporation and time, maybe you're getting 150, 200 bottles out of it. Uh, so they're claiming that it's just from the one. Typically, uh, a distiller will take 50, 60, depending on the size of the distillery, uh, a lot of barrels and blend them all together into a tank and then uh, they, they, they test them for consistency and get them out. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but if they pass on the blending process and just go single barrel, um, they, they'll label it as such because there's some, some demand for that. Uh, one example of one that's doing it right is Richland Rum in Georgia, Southern Georgia. Uh, they get you know, maybe a couple hundred bottles from each cask. And from cask to cask, the color can vary. Um, that's a no-no for a lot of the big producers, but Richland doesn't concern itself of that that much. So you can go to a liquor store and see three different bottles of Richland rum, that single, their single barrel rum. I believe actually it's all single barrel. I don't know that they do any blending at all. And uh, it might vary from bottle to bottle. And it, that might be um, a little alarming to you, but it's, that's a good sign. It's a good sign that it is legitimately single barrel. So, so as I said, the blending is a, a big part of the process. Uh, the bigger places are looking for consistency. They want the every bottle that tastes the same as every other bottle. They want every bottle from this year to taste like bottles that came out five years ago. And they have either a distiller or their blender or others. There's a lot of places they'll have a committee where they do a blind tasting and try to decide which one, which blends they want to use. The process of blending is, is pretty fascinating. Uh, people with really good palates have, are really talented at this. Uh, typically, they'll go through and taste all of the barrels. There might be hundreds of them. And over the course of a year, they'll go through and uh, take they have a, a someone in the distillery that goes in and pulls out little vials. They sit down in the conference room. They go through them one at a time and make notes on them, uh, barrel to barrel. And then they decide which one of these might be candidates for a single barrel bottling if they're going to go that way, or which ones they want to combine. <clears throat> and they uh, they'll be looking for you know a base rum, something that's solid. It's got some of those maybe those butterscotch notes, a little bit denser notes. And then maybe looking for barrels that have something a little bit brighter. Uh, a little bit, maybe a touch of citrus or floral uh, elements to it and use that for nuance and combine that. You know, places like, you know, I 
I visited a like, privateer in Massachusetts where the, uh, they go through, they might taste through hundreds of barrels and just select, uh, and they'll combine maybe a few dozen at a time into a tank uh, for bottling and then pull out some of their own single barrels from that. The uh, Maggie Campbell, who's the master distiller at Privateer, has uh, I think remarkable taste buds. I, uh, and I, I tasted through her there with one, she said this one barrel tasted a little bit briny and they're on a salt marsh in Massachusetts. And uh, she wrote me back afterwards, and I think you could taste it, just a very, well, okay, I'm lying, I couldn't taste it, she could taste it, she could taste some brininess to it. She's got a much more developed palate than I do. Um, but uh, she wrote back later, said that she was curious about it, and went and checked on the barrel, and it turned out that it had been shaved down on the inside early on, by whoever they bought it from. So it was uh, several centimeters uh, thinner than the other barrels. Uh, and so it's a good chance that some of the brininess from the air uh, and the salt marsh did get into that barrel. So there's all sorts, all the barrels are different. Blending is a big part of it. Um, also, uh, once you've got through the main phases, you get into the additives. Now, it's a small but dirty secret, uh, I think, for a lot of people that spirits can add a small amount of, well, whatever they want, not to traditional ingredients, traditional ingredients, to their spirit without noting this on the label. Uh, federal authorities allow up to two and a half percent of a bottle to be unlabeled additive. I know uh, rum makers who've added cane syrup and others who've added vanilla extract or molasses to their rums to give it the profile they want. I'm sure there's a lot of interesting stuff going on elsewhere that they're not telling to members of the press or consumers uh, just to, to tweak uh, what they want. I know as a uh, judge in a number of spirit competitions I've, I've been in uh, you know, a couple dozen probably, and it's several times uh, that I recall judges, we've got thought, you know, this is a spiced rum. It's not labeled as a spiced rum, but somebody's put spices in this. Um, just I think they wanted to boost the flavor or to mask some flaws in, uh, in their rum as it was. So you can, you can put these out of those things. But generally, you'll, you'll find these, uh, these, these you know, strike spices out. Generally, the three others that you'll find or sugar, glycerin, and caramel. Some, uh, some um, rum makers, I think, are quite open about what they add when they add sugar. The most notable of this is Plantation, which is based in France, but has uh, distilleries in Martinique and Jamaica. I'm not sorry, Barbados and Jamaica. Uh, they, but they source rum from everywhere throughout the Caribbean. Much of it they ship back to France and they age it in cognac barrels and cognac warehouses and they also add sugar to it they and they they as i said they're open about it they say in cognac there's a process called dosage which is just sort of a fancy word, way of saying adding sugar uh, for cognac and they are not apologetic about doing it with their rum uh, and I, I think it's fine that, that they're they're open about it several years ago the uh, swedish government went through all the rums that were available through the Swedish liquor stores and they had them analyzed for sugar and this was report came out it was a little bit cost a lot of, uh, of uh, interest among the rum aficionados uh, saying things like Ron Zacapa 20 grams per liter of sugar El Dorado 12 here 45 grams Bacardi 8 20 Bacardi Black 15 grams then there's Plantation 17 grams as I mentioned Plantation did not deny it I think some people were also surprised, like the Bacardi Superior, zero grams, uh, and the Havana Club was adding sugar. So people are adding sugar, just not uh, really admitting to it. Um, I, as I said, I really don't have objection of things going into my rums. And, I, and the other things are well, glycerin used for uh, mouthfeel. It gives it a little bit of density. You might have a rum that tastes okay, but has a little bit of thinness to it. You add some glycerin to it, it gives it a little more body and, and weight and uh, caramel coloring, which is a tasteless thing. It's basically burned sugar, just brown. People commonly use caramel sugar. And again, I talked about wanting every bottle on the store shelf to look like every other bottle as far as the tint of the liquor, and caramel is used for that quite commonly. And again, that can be under the 2.5% additives without any uh, label issues. I, uh, I don't have an objection to any of these things going into the rum, but all things being equal, I'll take a great rum with no additives if for no other reason than to celebrate the distiller's uh, abilities and um, talents. 
Um, if they do go into the ROM, I'd love them to be open about it. Would not mind seeing US labeling requirements uh, that would declare which additives are in each bottle of rum. And then you can make an informed decision. Uh, and I like to know what I'm drinking. Also under additives, I included, oh, I guess on the next slide, uh, barrel finishing. Uh, this is real big right now. As I said, bourbon casks are used for most rum aging. They'll go in there for three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, whatever. Uh, and then the a distiller will take them out of those barrels and rebarrel them in uh, another type of barrel that maybe for six months or so, six months, maybe a year. Uh, in this case, the cask might have held Cabernet, Madeira, tequila, brandy, stout, cider, uh, maple syrup, coffee beans, whatever. I don't think there's a single type of barrel that some enterprising craft rum maker hasn't stashed away rum in for some time to, to sell and market it. And these, I, I'm actually in favor of these. I like these. These are, uh, can add some really interesting and pleasing notes to a rum or it can make something taste like a candy shop. The Don Q made out of Puerto Rico by Sorales Distilling is, um, they've got an ambitious and I think very successful barrel uh, finishing program. They've used, uh, just in the last, I think two or three years, the ones they've released or are planning to release are Cognac, Vermouth, Port, Zinfandel, and Sherry. So just basically letting things sit for four or five, six months in these non-traditional barrels. But what comes out is real intriguing. Some cases like the vermouth one, which I like quite a bit, but it just doesn't, it doesn't taste like rum, but it's still quite tasty. I like it with an ice cube and, and, it, and it can do well with uh, mixed drinks as well. So get through this whole process. Uh, all that's really left is to dump the barrels, blend them in a tank, bring them down a barrel uh, to bottle proof uh, by adding water and then send them off to the bottling line. None of this really has much impact on the taste with some small asterisks and exceptions. Among these is the proofing process. A uh, barrel will typically be like 110 to 120 proof uh, alcohol when it's aging. Then when it's dumped out, the blender will, might choose to bring it down to 80 or 90 proof. 80 is the minimum in the US. You can't bottle rum at less than 80, 80 proof or 40% alcohol. Um, so the more careful distillers will do this in stages. They'll add a few percentage points of water at a time, let it sit for few weeks or a month, and then add some more water, bit by bit, bring it down to uh, proof. The risk of dumping a lot of water in rapidly is something called saponification, which is the creation, uh, describes the creation of fatty acids uh, and other elements as a spirit re reacts to the sudden influx of you know, the water and what might be some calcium in the water. Uh, the problem is saponification, it, it tastes like soap. If you've ever, it's not common, but I've had a few of these when I've been judging at rum competitions when I wrote down on the form, that tastes like soap. Uh, of course, the soap might come from the bottling line, which has been inadequately, uh, it's been cleaned, but inadequately rinsed. It could come from other things. But the bottling, you, it, it, can, you, it can influence the flavor, but it's, it's a rarity and it's a flaw. The saponification, also a flaw. This is something to bear in mind if you do taste something that seems a little bit soapy. Uh, any event, my, my heartfelt advice is to avoid soapy rum. That's what I do. So that's what I've really got for this week, unless you've got questions. Just to recap, last week I talked about how history has influenced rum and its flavors and how it was consumed. This week was biology and chemistry and its influence on rum. And next week, I'll look at how these come together, a tour of some rums on the market today, uh, where they're made, their history, how they're made. And I'll also talk about some notable rum cocktails. So have your glasses chilled and your bottles out, and uh, I'll see you next week. Meantime, if you have any questions, I'm here and uh, happy to entertain anything you want to ask about. Uh, Wayne, a couple uh, a couple questions. Uh, oh, well, first one was someone asked uh, the name of the cocktail you're drinking tonight from Bon Appetit. Yeah, it's called the Dark Moon Cocktail. It was uh, created by somebody from Stumptown Coffee Roasters, not a bartender. Um, and I'll give you the, the recipe here. The uh, actually we can pull off the uh, stop sharing here. I think. No. Uh, Maybe not. Anyway, here we go. Now I can stop sharing.
share. No, that just has my share. I don't know how to stop. <laughs> anyway. If, 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 you, uh, if you want to send it to me by email, I could send it out to the class later on. Okay. I'll That'd do that. Um, it, it is a good drink. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Um, a couple more questions. Does France have an ap appellation for rum like they do for wine? Only in the uh, islands. The, uh, there is AOC regulation for rum agricole of Martinique, rum agricole, I think it, maybe it is just of rum agricole of Martinique. I don't know if there's an appellation of rum agricole of Guadeloupe or Marie Galant. Not positive about that. But they are, they have uh, restrictions on how you make that rum and nobody else can call it that. It's a little bit it, this again it gets a little bit into the geekery of it but the uh there's a lot of debate over whether or not the word the phrase rum agricole should be used for any rum made from sugarcane juices and there are people who are doing that including in new orleans relaison has a rum agricole which is quite admirable um there's a rum agricole in south carolina there's been a rum agricole out of hawaii and california and there's uh, a little debate over whether or not I guess it, it, it edges into the appropriation debate about whether they American rum should be calling themselves rum agricole, spelling rum with an H, R-H-U-M, which is as it is in French. So it's it's a little it's a little a little bit controversial, but in small circles. So uh, the the answer is yes, there is an appellation for rum, but rum the rum is made in the French islands where the sugar cane is grown. All right. Um, so, so I understand that mishaps in the distilling process of moonshine can make a person go blind. Are there such problems that can be caused by bad rum distilling? The same as moonshine. I mean, it, a lot of the problems are methanol, which are, as I recall, are one of the lighter alcohols. And that comes off first. So if, what the problem is, as I say, once you start boiling it, once it's 80, 186 degrees, the alcohols start coming off. And the first alcohols that come off are the, the heads. And that might, I think, believe that includes methanol. I don't think those are tails. Might be wrong on that. But the, uh, you don't want that. And for a long time, people didn't know that you were supposed to cut out the, the heads. They would capture everything. As soon as it started boiling, you'd capture it and condense it and drink it. But it was, and they, they knew that you wanted to get rid of the tails because the tails had some nasty flavors to it. So the, the heads, has some toxic elements in them and you want to cut those out. So the moonshiners didn't know that. So they would just take everything off their stills and go blind or get Jake leg, sort of a strange form of paralysis that came from having the wrong alcohols. And the, uh, it can happen, it can happen with anything. It can, that's why home brewing is legal in the US, but uh, home distilling is not. You cannot distill your own just because it's potentially toxic. If you, you can't really poison yourself with home brewing, with making beer. Again, that's a natural process. Once you take the mechanical process in there, the possibilities for fatal error increase exponentially. So yeah, you can, you can screw up rum, but they don't. I mean, anyone who gets their license is, is expensive enough to get into this business uh, and nobody wants to poison anybody and lose all their investment. So it's safe. Um. You mentioned, it's kind of similar to this a little bit, but you mentioned um, that you distilled something more than one time to get the product. Why would you distill it a second time? And I'm guessing vodka, you do three, four, five. Is it, why would you do that? Would you use yeah. the same exact product each time? Yes, and it refines it. I mean, vodka, it's always amusing to people who or in the distilling industry when they see vodka's advertised as like distilled eight times or distilled 42 times. Remember that illustration I had of the column still, there's plates in them. Technically, each of those plates is a distillation because each of them have a different temperature and so it's going up and then coming down, going up, coming down. So uh, when people talk about vodka being distilled so many times, it just means they've got a column with, with 12 plates in it. So it's distilled 12 times uh, for the most part. With rum and with a pot still, it's different not necessarily with rum, but with a pot still, it's different because you do have to do it twice. There's a, what's called a stripping run, where you run it through the still to begin with, just to get it up to, I think it's maybe about 40, 
40% alcohol, and then you take that 40% alcohol and you run it through a rectifier, a rectifying run, uh, which then takes it up to, you know, much higher. In the case of rum, it might be anywhere between 60 to 80% uh, alcohol. With vodka, vodka by law has to be, I believe it's 92% alcohol coming off the still. So why vodka tastes so pure is because the laws say it has to taste pure because it's all ethanol. It's got no other uh, side ingredients, really. So it's a, um, yeah. So when you, you distill, you generally distill twice uh, just to get the right flavor profile to and just as I say, go through the stripping run, then through the rectifying run. And the, uh, that, that's pretty much what you need. If you, if you have to do more than that, you it's inefficient, so very few do. I mean, what, who's going to want to use the energy and the time to run it through a third time? Uh, you want to do it definitely twice uh, just to get up to the right proof level and to get the right flavor profile in it. But like I said, vodka, vodka is pure ethanol. It's, it's We're not doing a seminar on vodka, but there were big changes in May on vodka by federal definition. Uh, prior to May, vodka had to be colorless, tasteless, odorless, and I think it was characterless. So basically nothing, you, had to, you were making nothing uh, and selling that. Uh, but they dropped that requirement in May because it was basically the federal government was catching up to what the industry was already doing. So many of the smaller producers are using things like potato and milk solids and maple syrup and others to make vodka. And there are subtle flavor differences to it. It's not doesn't hit you in the face if you mix vodka with any sort of a mixer, whether it's Coke or tomato juice for Bloody Mary or, or uh, you know, ginger beer. It's gonna you're not gonna taste any difference at all between them. But there are differences, and now there's a little bit of uh, vodka's getting its getting a little bit more deserved swagger now as far as flavor profiles go. But it still has to be 92% alcohol off the still, which means it's clean. We've got one more, more of a comment, but uh, Christine LeBlanc says she bought a, a RHUM Agricol View, as in View Carré, at Dornyak's, and it was very disappointing. It did not taste at all like the rum Agricol from Guadalupe she got. Was the... Uh, maybe, Guad maybe that means she was Guatemala. No, I was from, I'm sure it was from, from Guadalupe. Guadalupe. I've had the rum agricole from Guadalupe. I'm wondering what the rum agricole vu was that Clement? I'm guessing, it might have been Clement. Uh, I think is is fairly commonly available now in the U.S. Um, I'm curious why she was disappointed though. Whether it was it was um, Christine, you can you can unmute and sign in and, and if you want. But I'd be curious to know why uh, it was disappointing. Was it because it didn't taste like uh, a traditional agricole? Because the the view would be, I can't remember what to this, I keep moving them around, but I think it was, um, I think they aged them like maybe uh, four to six years. It might be a view, might be a four year. So it ends up losing a lot of its agricoleness and just taking on more of the barrel flavor. So. Oh, I'm trying to show it to you. Uh, it, it, you know, I'm French. And uh, so I, I've really enjoyed the uh, Rome Agricole from Guadeloupe that my cousin were bringing me back to France and this it's not that it's not a good tasting rum it just doesn't have the freshness the the, right. the texture and I really would love to know where to get the real rum agricole from from Guadeloupe I would love to do that but this one was I, like favorite from Martinique actually oh, favorite. yeah and it you know nothing wrong with it it just didn't taste like a rum agricole which is so specific yeah, now was the rum from Guadeloupe you had? Was that a, a that's was that a white? The one I bought was Le Coeur de Rome, La Favorite, and it's Martinique. Right. Uh, oh, you said you had you said you had a Guadeloupe rum that you liked. The oh yeah. Yes. And was, was, that, was, was that white or was that aged? It was white. Yeah, that's going to be a very different flavor profile. So you could, I would go back to Dorniacs and see if you can find any from Martinique, but just look for the white ones. Don't get an aged okay. one. And, I've, uh, I've not seen anything, so uh, clear advice. We'll have to uh, we'll have to start agitating and start pestering the distributors to get some of the. Yeah. I, I I love uh, Nissan, uh, which I think I've seen in New Orleans. It comes in a square bottle, uh, white. It's usually uh, I don't know. I think here in the U.S. it's ninety proof, and Martinique it's hundred proof. Uh, it makes a great tea punch. I. 
I, I'm always a little bit sad when I go through a bottle of uh, rum Nissan and finish it up. But I have to keep looking for that. Uh, that says that um, check total wine in Metairie. Uh, okay. They they may have some uh, agriculture. So that that's a that's a, a new a new place that's worth trying out. So if anybody, right. anybody else have any other questions before we finish up for the night? All right, Wayne, thank you so much again. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Fascinating, multiple people are writing on here. So thank you so much. Really enjoyed it, learned a lot. And we'll see, and everyone will get the, uh, get the copy of tonight, uh, tomorrow morning. So. Okay, and I'll, uh, I'll shoot you the recipe in a minute so you can include that with it. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Take Thanks care, everyone. Much. See you next week. Bye.